Uh, hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. I previously looked at the banked curve example, except we didn't put any friction in that problem. Uh, we calculated what the speed was in order to safely go around that curve and to keep that circular path. Uh, what I'm going to do today now is I'm going to add the force of friction between the tires and the road. We're going to look at the free body diagram and we're going to find what is the maximum and the minimum speeds that I can safely go around uh, this banked curve. Again, if you like the video, give it a like button down below. And if you like what I'm doing on my channel, consider subscribing. All right, let's get started. All right, so this is going to be the cross-sectional view here of my car on the slope. What I've done is I've labeled a couple of the forces and these were the same forces that were there in the previous video where I didn't have the force of friction. Now I'm gonna entitle this one the slow case and let's imagine here that I'm going around the circle and I'm going too slow, right? If I'm going too slow, I'm not gonna stay on this circular path. What's gonna happen over here is I'm actually gonna to curve to a place where the radius is not quite as big, right? If my initial radius goes from the position of the car all the way to the center, uh, the new radius is actually a little bit smaller. Okay, so actually the force of friction in this particular case, the force of friction tries to oppose that motion. So if, if you look at it from the cross-sectional view, I have to place the force of friction kind of going up the ramp in this case. And again, this is actually going to be the force of static friction because actually there is hopefully no motion here uh, along this direction of the ramp. Now this force of static friction can be zero and it can go all the way to some maximum value. And you should remember from your physics class that the maximum force of static friction in this case is equal to the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force. And again, our normal force is always perpendicular to the ramp. Now what you have to do in this case here is again, we're going to break our forces down into vertical and horizontal components like this. I'm gonna call this positive Y direction and I'm gonna call the direction toward the center of the circle as positive X. All right, now what you have to do is we have to break our normal down into two components and we have to break the force of friction down into two components. So if you, take your time here, you should again argue that if this is the angle theta of the ramp, this is also the angle theta up here. And actually it's going to appear a third place in this diagram. This is also the angle theta up here. Now the reason you want to choose this type of coordinate system is because again, if the object is going around in a circle at constant speed, um, we know that the acceleration is toward the center of the circle and the magnitude of the acceleration is given by our centripetal acceleration equation. So let's go ahead now and write down all the forces acting in the X direction. Again, that is the direction acting toward the center of the circle. So there's really two forces that act toward the center of the circle. There's a component of the normal force. So I'm gonna call that the normal force in the X direction. And we'll break it down into components in just a minute. And now there's also a force of friction or a component of the force of friction that's also acting opposite of that direction. Right, if I go ahead and draw that force, uh, let's pick a different color over here. This would be the force of friction here. Let's call it force of friction, again, in the X direction. There's also gonna be a component of that force of friction that's along the vertical direction, which is going to be this one, force of static friction along the Y direction. And again, here we're calculating what the maximum value of these forces are, because really I wanna find out what's the minimum speed that I can safely go around this bend, and that's going to happen when I have the maximum force of static friction. All right, so let's go back to the sum of the forces, and now this is going to be minus the force of friction, static friction along the X direction. There's only two forces along the X direction. That must be equal to the mass of the car multiplied by the acceleration, and in this case, it's the centripetal acceleration. All right, so let's substitute our values here for the normal in the X direction and also the force of static friction in the X direction. Again, here we're just breaking down these forces into components. So right away, I should be able to write that down that the normal in the X direction, if this is the angle theta, this here should be N multiplied by sine of the angle theta. Now, what is the force of friction here in the X direction? That's the green one over here. Let's go ahead and find what that is. So the force of friction, in the X direction is going to be my force of friction, the maximum, and multiplied by cos of the angle theta. 
All right, and the maximum force of friction over here, this is just given by my expression, which is the coefficient of static friction multiplied by n, and then I still have this cos of the angle theta. All right, so let's go ahead and substitute that into our expression over here. So minus mu s, the normal force, cos of the angle theta, again, equals to m. And instead of writing the centripetal acceleration, let's go ahead and substitute in what our value is, which is going to be v squared. And this is actually going to be the minimum speed uh, divided by r squared. And it's minimum because, again, uh, friction is trying to hold it up if the speed's not big enough to stay on that radius. All right, so this is equation one. That one's super important. Let's now look at the forces in the vertical direction. In the vertical direction, I have three. I have the normal force in the vertical direction. Uh, that's NY. I also have this component of the force of friction. That's also acting up. So force of static friction along the y-axis. And then I have minus the weight. And all of those have to equal to zero. There's no acceleration here in the vertical direction. So if we go ahead now and we substitute our values, uh, here we're going to have NY is uh, the normal force multiplied by cos of the angle theta. Now, if you follow the same arguments as what I did over here, the force of static friction along the vertical direction, again, it's positive because it's acting up. And it's going to look very similar to that previous expression, except now you swap the sign for the cos. And the weight is simply equal to mg. I'm going to bring that on the other side so it'll become positive and mg. So here we have equation two. All right, if we look at both of these two equations, we have two equations and two unknowns. Uh, we just simply have to solve for those. The unknowns are the normal force and also what v minimum are. Okay, so we're going to come back to that in just a minute. We're now going to set up the equations in the free body diagram for the case where you're going really, really fast. All right, so for the fast case now, again, imagine you're trying to go around this bend, but you're going too fast. What's going to happen is that the total force acting toward the center is not big enough, and you're going to end up following a radius that is basically bigger than the previous case. All right, basically the radius gets bigger, okay, because you're going too fast. So in this case now, if you were going to go ahead and plot what the force of friction looks like, uh, let's go ahead and do that on the diagram. In this case, friction always opposes the motion. So again, the force of friction now in this case is always perpendicular to the normal force, the force of static friction. And again, we're going to look at the maximum value is going to be acting down the ramp. These are the three forces acting on the object, on the car in this case. And you see that we're going to have two forces now acting toward the center of the circle. So we can actually go faster than the case without friction. There's a component of the normal force again, just like before, that's acting toward the center of the circle. And again, there's going to be now this added component of the force of friction that's acting toward the center of the circle. We're going to use the same coordinate system. And again, if you define this as the angle theta, uh, we had previously defined it as the one up here. And again, now using just a little bit of trigonometry, you should also find that this is also the angle theta. So I'm going to choose the positive x direction to be toward the center of the circle. Let's start by writing down all our forces toward the center of the circle. So in this case, I have two forces. I have nx, which is the x component of that normal force. And I also have the x component of the force of static friction. Two forces acting toward the center of the circle. That equals the mass times acceleration. Now we substitute our values. nx, again, is always n multiplied by sine of the angle theta. Uh, that's this force up here, and x. And now I also have this component of the force of static friction. Again, in this case, you're going to have the coefficient, you're going to have the normal force, and you're going to have cos of the angle theta. Looks very similar to the previous case, except notice that the sign is switched because the force of friction is acting in the opposite direction, equals to mac. All right, what else do we have? Um, now we're going to look at all the forces in the vertical direction. Now, again, there's also some differences here. Uh, first of all, we have the normal in the y direction. Uh, the normal in the y direction is simply acting up here. It's this component of the normal force. And that I can just right away simply write n cos of the angle theta. And the other force I have now is a component of the force of friction that's also acting down. Right, that's this component down over here. If you look at the diagram carefully, so I should put down, that's going to be the negative direction. 
And again, it's got the coefficient of static friction and multiply by the normal. And again, I'm only picking up the vertical component of that. So that should be sine of the angle theta and minus the weight, which is mg uh, equals to zero. So again, I'm gonna call this equation one. Uh, equation two, let's just go ahead and bring mg on the other side. So equation two is uh, simply n cos theta, coefficient normal sine of theta, and that there equals to the weight. All right, this is gonna be equation two for the case where we're going too fast. And really, if I substitute the expression for the centripetal acceleration, in this case, this is really what the maximum speed that I'm trying to find where I can safely navigate this turn. Um, so that's the right-hand side of the first equation. All right, let's put all these together now and find an expression. Again, you have two equations, two unknowns. We have the normal, and in this case, we have V max. So let's go ahead and solve for both sets of equations and find out what is the range of velocities that I can safely maneuver around this banked curve. All right, so I've gone ahead and I've rewritten the expressions here that I obtained for the slow case and for the fast case. And I want you to notice a couple things. First, the equations look really, really similar. All right, they kind of have the same structure. You will notice one difference, however. So for the sum of the forces along the x direction, notice I have an opposite sign here. And I also have opposite sign for the some of the forces in the vertical direction for that middle term. Okay, so keep that in mind. So actually, if we wanna solve for what the speed is in each case, all we have to do, so I'll just work on the minimum speed, and then in order to find the expression for the maximum speed, I simply have to swap the sign of the term in front of the coefficient of static friction. Okay, so in order to solve for that, I'm gonna start with equation two, and my goal here is to look at equation one. I really need to get rid of the normal force here. It appears in two spots, so you can actually factor that out. And then I'm gonna substitute it with the expression I get from equation two. So this is equation two. So the normal force, which you should find, is simply the weight. And it's the weight divided by this angular term here. So it's cos of the angle theta, and then it also has this other term, coefficient of static friction multiplied by sine of the angle theta. All right, so that's an important expression here for uh, the normal force. And now what we're gonna do is simply substitute that expression up in equation one. And notice it involves, right, the normal force appears in the first two terms there. So really we can just substitute this entire value in. So this is what it looks like. So just rewrite it. Normal cos of theta plus coefficient of static friction sine of the angle theta. All right, that's the normal, and that multiplies this whole other term here. So there's two terms, there's sine of theta, and then minus the coefficient of static friction, cos of the angle theta. All of that equals to m, the minimum speed squared, and again, divided by the radius of that path. Uh, my goal was to find uh, the minimum speed. I noticed that the mass appears in two terms. You can get rid of that. It doesn't depend on the mass of the car, thankfully. Um, now you bring the radius on the other side and you take the square root and at the end we're left with one expression that the minimum speed that you can safely go around that banked curve when there is friction between the tires and the road will look something like this. So we get GR and all of that multiplies this angular term sine of the angle theta uh, minus the coefficient of static friction cos of the angle theta, and all that gets divided again uh, by the same term here, which is cos plus mu s sine of theta. And the nice thing about this is once you have this expression, if you really just uh, want to write down what is the expression for the maximum speed, well, all you have to do is, let's just copy and paste it, copy it over there, uh, let me move it over here, I have to change the name, and that's okay. So now I'm looking for the expression for the maximum speed. And like I said, if you follow the same steps, all we have to do is you have to swap the signs of both of those terms. So instead of having a negative sign like I did for the minimum speed, all you end up getting is a positive sign in the numerator, and you'll end up getting a negative sign in the denominator. 
All right, so there you have it, folks. So we have expressions for minimum and maximum speeds that you could safely navigate this turn. Now let's go ahead and go back to Talladega and calculate what is this maximum speed that I can actually go around this embankment at Talladega Racetrack. All right, so I thought we'd go back to Talladega Racetrack. In the previous case that I did without friction, I found that you can go around this radius of one of the curves there is around 1,100 feet, which is a little bit bigger than 335 meters. Uh, the angle that the track makes with respect to the horizontal is about 33 degrees. And if I converted things to miles per hour, the case without friction, I got 103.1. But we know cars go a lot faster than that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to apply the same data, except now I'm going to include a coefficient of static friction. So I googled what is the coefficient of static friction between tires, and I picked dry roads. Now if you have wet roads, clearly the coefficient of static friction will be a lot smaller. And race tires, they might even have a coefficient of static friction that's even bigger than this value, but it should give us a pretty good indication. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to manipulate this equation just a little bit because I, I find it just has too many terms. And you often see it written using the tangent and the angle theta. So let's go ahead and do that. So what you do here at the bottom is if I simply factor out a cos and then I use the cos and I combine it with both of those angular terms over here, what you're going to end up doing here is you're, at the bottom here, you're going to get 1 minus the coefficient of static friction. And I factored out a cos, so I'm going to get sine over cos, which is tangent of the angle theta. And tangent of 33 degrees is about 0.65. All right, and then the numerator over here, I use that cos that I factored out in the denominator, and I combine it with both of those. So the top simply becomes gr, and this here becomes tangent of the angle theta. Again, plus the coefficient of static friction. All right, now we go ahead and we substitute in all our values. And I did that, and what I ended up getting here was approximately 90.2. And careful, that there was in meters per second if I substituted all my data over here. Uh, if you go ahead and you convert that into miles per hour, and I did that, what I ended up getting was 201.3 miles per hour which is actually much faster than the case without any friction, right? Almost twice as big. Uh, actually, if you go up and you look at the record, uh, the record at this racetrack here is by Rusty Wallace in 2004. And the record, so V record, uh, in this particular race here for uh, Rusty Wallace was 216.3 miles per hour. Actually, which is pretty close to what we calculated over here. Again, a lot of different factors can come into play over here. I just assume 0 0.7 with an angle of 33. Uh, if the angle is a little bit, or if the angle is bigger, now maybe if the coefficient is slightly bigger, we could see how uh, what the coefficient would have to be in order to hit that uh, record speed by uh, Rusty Wallace.